The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. It was Sunday, March 3rd. We were working the night watch out of robbery division. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Didion. My name's Friday. For the past three months, we'd been tracking a pair of hold-up men. There was no pattern to their operation. There was only one thing we were sure of. They were young and they were brutal. We had to stop them. You don't know much about shopping, do you, Joe? No, not a great deal. That's what I thought. Had a couple of tips for you. You see these grapefruit? Mm hmm Thin skin. Yeah, that's the way they're good. No, Joe. Grapefruit is a tropical fruit. The thick skin protects it from the sun. Sweeter that way. Boy, I never heard that before. Yeah, you don't know much about shopping either. And look at the butter. Yeah, what's the matter with it? Well, that's more than we used to pay it. Bakery wasn't open, huh? Sure, I got the stuff. Well, where's the raisin bread? Right oh. there. No butter horns? No, they don't make those on Sundays. I got bear claws instead. Take a look at them. Well, wait a minute. You're not going to touch those, eh? Well, I want to show them to you. Yeah, but not with the hands, Joe. Look. Reach in, try to use a piece of paper. So. Easy. Try it. Yeah, easy. Sure. Now, when you were in the store, didn't the girl take this out of the counter with a piece of paper and put it in the sack? Nope, she used her hands. She even went to the wrong bakery, huh? You know, Frank, I don't like to say anything, but I can't keep coming over here to your place for breakfast. Well, why not? If you didn't, you know you wouldn't eat a good breakfast. Yeah, but Faye's going to start resenting it pretty soon, isn't she? Ah, uh, Joe, don't be silly. She knows, too. You don't know how to cook a decent breakfast for yourself. How about the coffee? Is it ready yet? No, it hasn't started to perk yet. I don't know why. It's been on for ten minutes. You got to plug it in. Oh. Well, what do you want to eat, Joe? Well, a couple of eggs will be all right. Mm-hmm. Better start the toast. Well, do you always start the toast before you start the eggs? Sure. Well, don't you remember last week? The toast got a little cold. That's right. Better hold off a minute. How do you want them? Scrambled? Well, is that the only way you know how to make them? I know, you old rib staker. You want one of my Spanish omelets. That sounds okay. You heard from your mother lately? Yeah, I got a letter day before yesterday. She thinks she's going to like it back east? Yeah, she's with her sister. You know, it gives her a lot more company. She's still with her sister? No, she got a house just down the street now. Oh, I see. Imagine you miss her, huh? Yeah, I guess I do, but in the long run, it's best for her. Yeah, I suppose so. Well, you want to get the eggs? Yeah, where do you keep... Uh, Joe, where do people usually keep eggs? Refrigerator. That's my boy. Say, this omelet of yours won't take very long, will it? We haven't got much time, you know. I'll have it on your plate in a jiffy. What time are we supposed to see those victims? 9.30 at the county hospital. Thanks. You want to get me a couple of tomatoes? Sure, where are they? In the refrigerator, remember? Oh. Twenty-eight jobs in three months. Those guys really move, don't they? Yeah. Now, these are nice tomatoes, Joe. I bought these. That Holland Beck job last night, the vicious punks. Yeah. There was no reason to work the old man over the way they did. What'd the doctor say? Well, he's gonna get over it, but they knocked out all of his front teeth. Fifty years old. Same M.O. every job. Aren't you gonna peel those? Well, no, Joe. The skins are good for you. Ninety percent of the good's inside the skin. Well, how about a big Bermuda? What? Bermuda onion. Oh, yeah. Will you get it for me? Where? Oh, yeah. Where? Right down there in the vegetable crisper. No, Joe, down there in the bottom in that bag. Oh, yeah. What you want? A Bermuda onion. They're yellow. They're down in there. Look around. Let's see. H-I. Hi. Is this what you wanted? No, Joe. I want a big one and a yellow one. Now, just root around down in there. You'll find them. 
kids, 19, 20-year-old stick-up artists. Knock a man senseless for half a buck. Robbing, slugging, kicking their way around the city. Yeah. This will be one bunch I'll be glad to catch up with. There you go. Was that the biggest there was? Yeah, there was red ones like that, yeah. yeah. Now remember, Joe, this is a Bermuda. Oh, no, no. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, you're gonna peel that, aren't you? What, and lose half the flavor? No. Well, I know, I always peel them. Joe, never peel them for an omelet, remember? Well, that'll probably cook down. All right, now we're gonna stir up the whole works. Looks good, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah. You gonna put it in that pan there on the stove? Yes, sir. It's a little hot, isn't it? It's sure smoking. Well, that's how you make a Spanish omelet, Joe. Hot fire, let fire do the work. Is that so? Into the pan. Oh. Now, Joe, the secret of a Spanish omelet is you gotta work fast. Put all those little brown things on the top. Oh, those onion skins. Yeah. Oh, that doesn't look right to me. Well, you taste it. I'll get it. Yeah, you better. I can't leave. This is a beauty. Hello. Yeah, he's here. No, this is Friday. Oh, hi, young. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're supposed to see him at 9.30. Oh, uh-huh. Newsstand, huh? Yeah. You betcha. Right? Bye. Just look at that, Joe. Yeah. The best Spanish omelet I ever made. That's yeah, too bad we're not gonna have time to eat it. of a small newspaper and soft drink stand just off the intersection. Mrs. Wilden was being carried to a waiting ambulance when we got there. She was unconscious. From her forehead to her chin, her face was a swollen mass of welts. Her nose had been broken, and she had fractures of the jaw and cheekbone. Her husband, John Wilden, age 56, had a single bruise on his forehead over his left eye. We questioned him after the ambulance attendants gave him first aid. His description of the holdup men tallied almost perfectly. One was a redhead, another one had dark hair, both about the same height. I'd say as tall as you are, officer. Matches, Joe. Kid bandits, huh? Frank, what's that by your foot there? Where? On the floor. Oh, look at matches. There. Thank you. These yours, Mr. Wilden, these matches? No, I don't smoke. For your wife's, maybe, huh? No, don't think so. Neither one of us smoke. Big Ten Cafe. Steaks, chops, short orders open all night. On the inside cover here, George Bell and S. Cameron, Fifth and Alameda. Do you handle cigarettes, cigars here? Mm, no, sir. Candy, soft drinks, newspapers, that's all. You sure you don't recognize those? Big Ten Cafe. No, never heard of it. How about the names on the inside of the cover there? George Bell, S. Cameron. No, never heard of them. Well, when you first came in here, Mr. Wilden, do you remember where the holdup men were standing? Well, not too well. One was there and one's over there, I think. Could be, Joe. Maybe one of them dropped it. Mm -hmm. well, you trace them from that matchbook? Do you think that's possible? Well, we don't know yet. Well, how would you trace them that way? Analysis? Some kind of scientific work? No, sir. Leg work. 9.28 a.m. We call Leighton Prince. As soon as they arrived, we dropped Mr. Wilden off at Georgia Street Receiving Hospital to see his wife. After he saw her, Frank and I drove him back to the office. We had him check the mug books. He couldn't identify any of the suspects. We had the crime report typed up and got out a supplementary broadcast on our original APB. We asked Lieutenant Edward Swan and r &I to run the names George Bell and S. Cameron through the files for a possible make. We checked with the restaurant advertised on the cover of the matchbook, the Big Ten Cafe. The manager of the cafe failed to recognize either the names on the matchbook or the descriptions of the holdup men. 9.52 a.m. We checked back in at the office. I'll get him. Right. Robbery, Smith. Oh, hi, Ed. Well, you did, huh? Uh-huh. I see. Okay, thanks. 
Bellance for it? Yeah, he ran a make on the name George Bell and Sam Cameron. They've been running together. Both got long juvenile records. Good. You got an address on them? Yeah, they won't be hard to find. What do you mean? Main jail. <laughs> Five days before, George Bell, a laborer, and Samuel Cameron, a part-time jewelry salesman, had been booked at Main Jail on charges of being drunk and disorderly. The day after his arrest, Cameron was bailed out. Bell was still in jail. Frank and I went down to the Main Jail and talked to him. He didn't fit the description of either of the bandits. He was very cooperative, but he stated that he had been very drunk and he couldn't remember too much. I just don't know, Sergeant. Sam and I went out and tied one on. When I came to, I was in the drunk tank. You have no idea at all your name's got on this matchbook, huh? Oh, I'm trying to think. We are pretty well heated up, Sam and me. That's another thing, that dirty Sam. What do you mean? Well, he gets a friend of his to come down here and bail him out. You think he'd do anything for me? No, nah, and I bought the liquor. He lets me sit here now. Dirty Sam. You think he might remember about the matchbook? I don't know. I'm disgusted with him. If you see him, you can tell him that. Just let him know he's off my list. How about the address there on the matchbook, George? It says 5th and Alameda. Does that mean anything to you? Weren't you and Cameron hitting some of the spots around that area? No, we were messing around over in Dogtown. We didn't get down by Alameda at all. Well, that must have some tie-in for you. Fifth and Alameda. No. The only guy I know down there is Sanchez. Wait a minute. Yeah? Just a minute. Sanchez. Gus Sanchez. Sure, I wanted to see Gus. I thought he put a bail for us. Yeah, go ahead. Well, this other mooch is in the tank next to me, see. Somebody had popped bail for him, and he's getting out in an hour. And I asked him if he'd call Gus for me, and he said he would. So he writes my name down, and he writes down Sam's, too. Dirty Sam. And he writes down Gus's address. Yeah, Fifth and Alameda. You remember what this man looked like? The one who took your names? Let's see. No, everything was going wrong. He was kind of tall. I don't know. Would you remember him if you saw him again? The guy did me a favor, I'd remember him. I'm not like that dirty Sam. Now, how about his name? Did he tell you that? No, I didn't ask him. I should have, huh? You're sure about the day this man was released, huh? Positive. Same day I came in, Tuesday. Okay, Bell, thanks a lot. We'll be checking back with you. All right, what about this guy? You got to beef with him, huh? Maybe if he's the one we want. What'd he do? He lost his matches. Frank and I left the interview room and went down the hall to check with the officer in charge. We paged through the release book and found that 57 men had been bailed out or discharged from the jail on the previous Tuesday. We went back to the record bureau and had them pull the mug shots on all 57 men. We then took the pictures back to the main jail and showed them to George Bell. This one, I think. I can't be sure. I think that's him. George Bell had tentatively identified the mug shot of a Fred Gunther, WMA, 21 years old. Gunther had a previous record of grand theft auto, purse snatching, and drunk charges. His picture matched closely with the description of one of the suspects. 4 p.m. We contacted the Kid Bandit's most recent victim, John Wilden. We asked him to look at the same group of mug shots we'd shown to George Bell. Here. This here. He's one of them. You sure, Mr. Wilden? Yeah, he's the one who slugged me. Who is he? His name's Fred Gunther. Oh, then you know him. Want me to identify him? Yes, sir, when we find him. checked out the suspect, Fred Gunther. There was no trace of him at any of his previous addresses. Monday, March 4th, 9 a.m. We began checking with the other victims of the Kid Bandits. After a day and a half of legwork, we sat down and figured out the results. More than two-thirds of the victims definitely tabbed Gunther as one of the holdup men. During the period Gunther was in custody, there were no robberies which had the same M.O. as that used by the suspect. The next step was the record bureau. We had them pull the packages on every one of Gunther's known friends and associates. There were more than 30 of them. We had mug shots pulled on each one of them and made the rounds of the victims for the second time. Approximately half of the victims had singled out one picture as that of Gunther's partner in the holdups. We pulled a package on the man and checked his mama sheet. His name was Harold Reimers, WMA, age 19. Previous record included car stripping and one charge of ADW, no conviction. Oh, he's a pretty good candidate, Joe. I'll bet on it. Did you come up with a middle name on him yet? No, it's not in the pack. He's Harold Reimers. That's the only way he's listed. Did you send out the broadcast yet on him? Yeah, I'd know him to type it up. They're getting it out now. Send it out in APB, too. That's good. Well, here's the list right here. Might as well get started on it. What time you got? Oh, five past three. How many on the list? Well, let's see here. Let's say 53, 55, something like that. Names and addresses of every guy Reimers or Gunther ever ran with. It's going to be a long haul. 
Hancock County, the phony leads we picked up on the way, huh? You know, there's only one thing I can't quite figure out yet. Yeah, what's that? Well, if this guy Gunther is one of the bandits, how come he was stupid enough to let himself get picked up on a drunk charge right in the middle of a string of robberies? Who knows? We could have kept him in jail if we had the right word at the right time. Yeah, well, we didn't. That's what counts. It's probably why he got himself bailed out in a hurry, too. Well, you ready? No, let me clean this up. All right. I guess we're not going to make it home for dinner, huh? No, not a chance. Better call your wife. She's getting as tired of this thing as I am. I get it. Robbery Friday. Who's that? Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Uh, well, just a minute. Now, what's that address again? Uh-huh. Yes, sir, right away. What do you got? There's a bartender over on Central Avenue read about the case in the paper this morning. Yeah. Says he can show us where to find Gunther. <laughs> Bartender's name was Sobel. He pointed out a rooming house in the vicinity of his tavern where he said Fred Gunther was living, at least a man who looked like Gunther. We found the man, but he resembled Gunther only slightly. He gave his name as Walter Judd. We checked him through R&I. He was clean. There was no question about the tavern keeper's intentions. Like many citizens, he only wanted to lend his cooperation, a commodity that's sought after and appreciated by every peace officer in the nation. Friday, March 8th. We continued our check of the friends and associates known to the two suspects, Gunther and Reimers. We got nowhere. Two weeks passed. On March 23rd, we got a tip from an informant about a girlfriend of Fred Gunther's, a vocalist working in a downtown cocktail lounge. Excuse me. You Lorraine Stanley? Yes, that's right. Sweet Lorraine. My billing. You from the union? No, ma'am. We're police officers. We'd like to talk to you for a minute if we could. Sure, all right. What's it about, officer? Do you know a Fred Gunther, Miss Stanley? Yes, I know him. I used to be engaged to Fred. You happen to know where he is now? No, I really don't. Guess I haven't heard from him in three, four months. He usually looks me up when I'm in town. Maybe he's sorry about something, I don't know. He hasn't contacted you at all? Not since I got back from Bakersfield a month ago. I played 32 weeks in Bakersfield. Ramble in. Sure hated to leave. Nice place. Mm -hmm. Where does Gunther stay in town? Do you happen to know? Used to be that hotel on South Flower. I called him there, but they said he moved. I used to like Fred a lot. Not enough to marry, though. Do you have any idea where he might have gone? Where we might contact him? No, I really don't. There isn't anything wrong, is there, with Fred, I mean? No, it's just a routine investigation. We'd like to talk to him. What's it about? Can you tell me? That's a robbery investigation. We want to locate Gunther. Do you happen to know any of his friends here in the city? No. Maybe that's why I didn't call. He's in trouble. Robert. Robert. We'd like to talk to him, that's all. If he's done something wrong, I'm not going to hide him. I can't afford to get mixed up in it. I've got a career to think about. I've worked too hard to throw it away. How about the places Gunther usually visits, Miss Stanley? Bars, restaurants? Know any of those? Yes, I remember a few. I can give you names if you like. Fred, hope he didn't do it for me. Ma'am? Fred says he's in love with me. I don't know. He thinks I want money. Maybe that's why he's doing it. I told him, but he never believed me. All I want's my career. You think Gunther might come around here to see you? Probably. He usually does when I'm in town. How about where you're living? I'm staying at a different hotel this trip. He doesn't know where it is. Poor Fred, he's going to be awful disappointed. Yeah? How do you mean? We said he was going to get the money to buy a ring. You're gonna marry me this time. Sure. This is my new theme, officers. You like it? Just one more thing, Miss Stanley. If Gunther contacts you by phone, will you be sure and let us know? Yes, all right. I'll do that. Sure, a beautiful theme, isn't it? Piano player in Bakersfield. A fellow by the name of Hamilton. He wrote it for me. Yes, ma'am. Hope Fred understands. I don't want to hurt him, but I can't marry him. How do I make him understand? How do I explain it? I don't think you'll have to. Before we left Lorraine Stanley, we told her that if Gunther should contact her, not to tell him she talked with us. Stakeouts were placed on the bar where she worked and at the hotel where she was staying. Gunther's known hangouts were also covered. The next night, the kid bandits were back in business. They hit twice, a liquor store on Franklin Avenue and a drug store on South Flower. Gunther and Reimers were again identified as the two suspects. The stakeouts continued. The search went on. Four days later, we got a tip from the proprietor of a shoeshine stand on West Temple that Gunther's partner, Harold Reimers, had been seen entering a small hotel up the street from his stand. We drove over and checked with the desk clerk. He identified Reimers' mugshot. He told us that the suspect wasn't in, but that he was expected back that night. Frank and I went on stakeout in his hotel room. 7 p.m. Reimers failed to show. Well, aren't you hungry, Joe? Yeah, a little bit. What time you got? 20 after 7. My stomach's starting to growl. 
Well, I'll call the office, see if maybe I can get us a relief, huh? Yeah, good idea. Hello. Yes, would you be kind enough to get us Michigan 5211? Well, yes, sir, I understand. We'll pay for it. Well, yes, sir. Yes, I know about the service charge. That's all right. On the way down, all right? Fine. Yes, thank you. Michigan 5211. Robbery, please. Robbery, 2511. Thank you. Hi, Wynn. This is Friday. Young around? Thank you. Hi, Young. This is Friday. We're sitting out here at the... I did, huh? Wynn. Yeah, right. You betcha. Well, Gunther and Rammers, they just hit again 20 minutes ago. Yeah. Gunther got away. Yeah, they got rhymers. Seven forty-five p.m. Frank and I got back to the city hall and went to the squad room. Together with Young and Carr, we tried to question the suspect, Harold Rhymers. We talked to him for over an hour. He refused to tell us anything. He was taken to the main jail where he was booked in on two eleven p.c. I'll get it. Robbery Smith. Oh yeah, ma'am, he's right here. You, Joe. Friday talking. Oh, yes. Yes, ma'am. How are you, Miss Dent? He did it. What did he say? Uh-huh. You bet. Yes, ma'am, right away. Lorraine Stanley over at the bar. Just got a call from Gunther. Yeah? Says he's on his way over. Uh-huh. 9.25 p.m. We called the men on stake out at the bar and alerted them. Young, Carr, Frank, and I got in the car and drove over. We checked with the detail on stakeout and told them of the latest developments. We talked with the Stanley girl. She hadn't seen or heard anything further from the suspect. We checked the place for Gunther. Apparently, he hadn't arrived yet. Frank and I staked out at the bar. Young and Carr covered the rear entrance. We waited. What time you got, Joe? 10.30. Guy must feel pretty sure of himself. Pulls a robbery, almost picked up. Three hours later, makes a date to show in a public place. Yeah, well, he hasn't shown yet. I'm not too sure about the Stanley girl. What do you mean? Well, she's that big an attraction for him. Isn't that the only way in? I mean, besides the rear entrance? Yeah, young and car back there. There's a gun outside. Won't you want to pick it up? You stay with him. We'll call in. All right, folks. Just go back to your seat. Nothing to see here. Just sit down, Axel. It's all over. Just sit down. It's all over. Please. Nothing to see here. That's all there is. Thank you. You got a dime? Yeah. Here. Thanks. Hey, Joe. Yeah. As soon as we take Gunther downtown, we're coming right back here. Why? What do you mean? Take a look at that fry cut. That fellow makes a Spanish omelet exactly like I do. On July 19th, trial was held in Department 86, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Suspects were tried and convicted of first-degree robbery, five counts, and assault with a deadly weapon, four counts. 
First-degree robbery is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for not less than five years. Assault with a deadly weapon is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period not to exceed ten years.